here's what you're going to do. I'm going to give you some time, like around 10 minutes, and I want you to read these two different explanations of grid search CV. One is right here in the notebook, which I wrote, and so you can access the notebook in the usual way um, by clicking on it here or however you usually access it. Um, so read over this first explanation that I wrote and then read over the second explanation which I found online in a Medium article and I'm going to post the link in the chat here on Zoom. And then um, when you're done reading them, there's some discussion questions and you don't have to answer all of these questions, but just pick one of them and that way if you all pick one and there's 100 of you or 78 of you today, we're going to get answers for all of them. So pick one of these questions and answer it and paste it in the Google Doc. And let me give you the link. Here's the link in the chat. Um, and you'll be able to put your answers. To, so whichever question you want to answer, just put in your answer there. And uh, and I'll be able to see the answers coming in in real time, so I'll kind of have a sense of when to stop. So yeah, go ahead and, and take, take some time to read both of those things and answer the questions. I'll give you maybe around 10 minutes. Okay, so let me try to give you my thoughts then. Um, so why did I do my explanation the way I did it? Um, so there's kind of some principles that I applied when, when writing that. Um, that I want to talk about here. So one is about um, talking about concepts before labels. So I kind of provocatively in my explanation waited until literally the last sentence before saying, by the way, these are called hyperparameters and this is called hyperparameter tuning. I mean, maybe that's a bit extreme to make that like the very last sentence, but I put that there intentionally to say, you know what, that's just a bunch of big words that don't really help you understand what's going on unless you've already heard those words before and you could say oh yeah i've heard of that um so to someone who's coming at this with experience like in the medium article it really makes sense to start with you know hyperparameters because someone is probably coming here to learn about hyperparameters and they want to optimize them they want to learn how and this connects them to something they already know but in my case the intended audience was someone who didn't already know about this and so there was no point I felt just throwing a bunch of big words at them. Because um, I feel like you kind of want to build the thing up in your brain and then you can put a label on it at the end, um, which is essentially what I'm saying here. So, um, and again, this it's not necessarily about better or worse. I mean, for someone who already knows about hyperparameters, the Medium article is more useful because they don't need the whole like, what is a hyperparameter? Um, but if the person doesn't know, then they're going to get confused right away. And so imagine reading this grid search is the process of performing hyperparameter tuning in order to determine the optimal values for a given model. If you're new to this, that's not going to be helpful. Whereas this is takes something you already know as kind of an anchor point and, and brings you into it. So that was my intention there. Um, yeah, there's this. Richard Feynman is a, is a very quotable physicist, and he has this great video clip about the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something, and that's kind of what we're getting at here, is um, just because you know the name of something doesn't mean you know it. And so I like to start with the thing itself and then put on the name. Okay, so the next kind of principle is this idea of bottom up explanations and the curse of knowledge. So the curse of knowledge, you can click on the link. Um, anyway, it's, you can read about it. But basically, when you know a lot about something, it can be harder to explain that thing. Because when you're explaining something, you kind of want to simulate in your head, the experience of the person you're explaining it to. And if that person's experience is very far removed for, from you, it can be harder to do that simulation and try to think about what they may be stuck on. And so that's how I think about the curse of knowledge. And so um, for me, the Medium article was very top down. It's like, we're going to start with this idea of hyperparameter optimization, assuming you know what it is, and then get into the details and, and more details. Um, 
And if someone reading that already knows, it's good because they can immediately understand what they're talking about. If someone doesn't know, uh, then, it's, then it's bad. And I think a very common communication breakdown that I see is these kind of uh, top-down explanations when the people aren't actually already experienced in what you're talking about, and then they get confused. So the bottom-up explanation is like start from the the start from an example or an analogy, um, not like a very abstract concept, but a very concrete, like hard, tangible concept, um, which is what I tried to do. So start with the the airplane. Uh, most most people have been in an airplane or seen a picture of one and okay there's a bunch of things I have to fiddle with okay this is about fiddling with things okay I can run with that now tell me more that's kind of the bottom up idea um, any questions or comments someone said especially when you're super excited about the topic yeah um, yeah that that has its pros and cons when trying to communicate, for sure. Okay, so another kind of principle here is um, presenting new ideas in small chunks. So I kind of think of it as like you're kind of getting the person to cross a pond or a river and you need to put down some stones for them. And if there's a stone missing, like they're just going to fall in the river. And so what is that first stone? It's this idea of fiddling with something. And what is that second stone? It's like, okay, there's some machine learning model I want to tune. And, but now I have a problem, but how am I going to solve the problem? And then what are we going to do? And how are we going to do it? And, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when you get to the end, it's like, oh, what you just did is called hyperparameter optimization. Another kind of strategy is bringing examples from many different angles. So, um, okay, I should be, how should I say this? Um, these two points kind of contradict each other. So let me try to clarify what I'm saying here. It is useful to keep your running example going all the way through. So if halfway through the explanation, I was like, and now I take my SVM and the person was like, what, but I thought we were doing a random forest. And then another, you know, partway through the explanation, it's like, and the hyperparameter we were optimizing was some other thing that can get very confusing. So it, it's nice to have kind of a running example. Um, but then if you have time, it's good to come at the concept additionally from other angles. So, okay, what if you were doing it? I guess these aren't really examples, but let me say approach from all angles. But what if you were doing it without hyperparameter tuning? Like, how much is this helping you? Um, what if you're using different types of hyperparameter tuning? Um, so, try to kind of build it up um, all around. Another one, another kind of rule of thumb is when experimenting, show the results. So, I think this is a very common issue, especially in machine learning kind of communication that I've seen someone give a presentation for like an hour straight. And then at the end, they were like, and we got 90% accuracy. Uh, and I think that's a big mistake. I think as a person is listening, they need to know, am I listening to someone telling me about something that works or am I listening to someone tell me about something that failed. Like, as you're filing away what they're talking about, you really need to know that. Um, and so I would say, in this case, I mean, in this case, I didn't have an hour long thing. I just had a little kind of snippet, but I showed some code and then I immediately showed the result. And that'll help the person go back and look at the code and kind of connect the experiment to what the result was gonna be. Um, so I think that's very useful. Another tip is, uh, and may maybe the most important one, uh, other than the, the top down, bottom up, and this one are probably the two most important ones. Um, so interesting to you does not mean that it's useful to the reader. So for example, this is something I orig originally had in my explanation, but I deleted. 
Some hyperparameters like N estimators are numeric. Numeric hyperparameters are like the knobs in the cockpit. Like I was so happy, I was so smug with my great analogy. You got your knobs, you can turn to any value and you got your switches in the cockpit of the airplane that you can turn up and down that are like categorical hyperparameters. And like, yeah, that's a good analogy, but do they really need to know this right now? Is this like the most urgent thing to say? Um, and and I, I ultimately, I didn't think it was like, there's more, if I was going to extend it from 400 words to 500 words, this probably wouldn't be the next thing I was going to add. There's probably more urgent kind of fundamental things to add first. So um, it's really important to check yourself and ask yourself the questions like, why am I including this? Um, is it because it's elegant? Is it to make myself look good? Um, and so I guess, yeah, other than the top down thing, probably the second most common mistake I see in communication is that people take sort of a self centric approach rather than a reader or a listener centric approach. And the, the main manifestation of that I see is people spending time on something proportional to how long they spent. So so I have someone working on a project. They spent a month like trying to deal with this bug. It was so hard to figure out the bug. They finally figured it out. And then they spend 20 minutes of their presentation on that because it was, it took up 20% of their six month internship. And so they were like, well, I really want to tell you about this bug. It was a crazy bug. Let me tell you all the stuff that I did, but no one actually really cares. Sadly, the people listening are maybe like, the CEO of the company or whatever, and they just don't care. Um, so really asking yourself, does the person <laughs> listening care about this? Um, and, and, and sometimes it's painful to, to cut something out that means a lot to you, but I think it's important for, um, for communication skills. So why am I telling you all of this? Why do we even have two lectures on communication in an applied machine learning course? And I kind of feel like maybe I should move this to the beginning. Um, I usually tell people why they should care so that they pay attention and then you start telling them the stuff. Um, but why should you care having already done half an hour of this? So here's the thing, um, applied machine learning is not usually a solo activity. And honestly, that's probably true for most of the stuff you're doing these days. If you're doing software engineering or science, um, then it, it's all kind of true as well. But most people practicing ML are working in an organization with more than just themselves. And they need to talk to those people. They need to talk to their data engineers. They need to talk to the CTO. They need to talk to the clients of the company if they're working at a consulting company. They need to talk to the software developers. So if you're really good with the coding, but you can't get things from your brain to anyone else's brain, that's really going to limit your effectiveness probably in anything you do, but anyways, for our purposes in applied machine learning. Um, and so what we're going to talk about for the second part of today kind of relates to this that, well, why are we doing machine learning in the first place? Usually to make some sort of decision. Um, so why are we predicting a house price? Well, because we're going to try to buy or sell a house at that price. Why are we just trying to pick, predict an avocado price? Because we need to make decisions about our purchasing of avocados. Why are we predicting if something is a fraud or not? Because we're going to need to cancel the transaction if we think it's a fraud. So usually, ultimately, there is some human reason why you're predicting something. And so you're going to need to talk to other people about why that is happening. And um, this also really, and so what kind of stuff are you going to talk about? Well, um, your scores. So if you don't know how to communicate your uncertainty properly, you could get into big trouble because the person leaves thinking that they heard you say 90% somewhere. And so now they're expecting 90% accuracy in deployment, but that's not going to happen because you couldn't articulate the risks of going from train test to deployment. 
or maybe they need to talk to their clients um, about why certain predictions were made. So, or, or maybe there's laws about it. So, you know, in a highly regulated industry like finance or health, if your model makes some decision, you may have a regulatory obligation to say, here's why my model did this. And so you have to communicate your, your reasons and you can't show a SHAP plot to a completely non-technical person. You have to be able to communicate what the plot is saying and you have to be able to say, here's why I think the model made this kind of prediction. Here's the risks, here's the uncertainties. Um, here's the experiments I did to try to build my confidence in this result. They need that information to act effectively. Um, and with machine learning, it's just, it's just pretty hard. Like it, it's really hard. If you have some fancy model and you want to know why it made that prediction, hopefully I've convinced you by now throughout this entire course, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, and so, the more you can communicate those things, I think the, the better you're going to do in this field. So yeah, why did it make a prediction? Can we trust test error? Um, this one, what does it mean? We're going to talk about this more on Tuesday. I'm just going to take a look at the chat. I think one of the struggles in reporting ML is how to switch the lingo. Yeah, um, I think that is an important point. And if I can just emphasize something we talked about earlier, think carefully about who your audience is, because I mean, sometimes having ML terms is fine. Um, and sometimes someone's going to have no clue what you're talking about if you say train test split and, and cat boost or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely important to think about your audience there and analogies can definitely be useful in this type of communication. Are there other questions or comments? Okay, so just to set the plan for the rest of today, we're going to talk about um, the idea of decisions. And um, next class, we're going to talk about this probability stuff and we're going to talk about visualizations. So let's take our break now and I'll see you at 11.39. Okay, so the next thing is ML and decision making. So there's often this gap between uh, what people want to happen or care about and what ML can do. And that's something that's important for you to understand as well um, as a machine learning practitioner. Um, and so what's useful to think about kind of the limits of what we can do here is to think about what decisions will be made using ML. Because again, if your mind, if, 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 if you only go to, okay, and I made a prediction of, of fraud or, oh, and I predicted the price is 120,000 and you, and you just stop there. Um, I think that will limit you compared to if you think, okay, and what is that prediction going to be used for? What is going to be the consequence of that? And so, decisions have kind of a structure to them that we can think about. There's usually some kind of decision variable that is going to be manipulated. And that's not the same as the prediction. So for example, um, if you're thinking about selling your house and you're using machine learning to try to decide how much it's worth, how much you should sell your house for isn't necessarily going to be the prediction. Maybe if the prediction is 120,000, you decide, well, actually, I'm going to try to list it for 130,000. Um, or maybe you're going to just look at that and try to make a categorical decision. Should I sell my house? Question mark or not. Um, and then you have objectives, like what is your ultimate goal? And if you have come from like an economics kind of background, you've probably thought about utility functions and all this kind of stuff. But what are your goals um, that you wish to manipulate or improve through the decision variable. So for example, 
my goals might be multifaceted. It might be the total profit from selling the house, uh, but also how long it takes, how long am I gonna have to wait? So maybe I have multiple objectives that are combined in a kind of a complicated way. And in knowing these will definitely help you out. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in like the credit card fraud kind of case in that your objectives kind of told us that having a false negative was gonna be more of a problem than a false positive. And then there's the context, just all the information going on that's gonna affect um, my, my objectives and how the decision variables are kind of coming into play. So what is the housing market right now? Um, what is the cost of marketing? How long can I wait? Or for example, in the fraud case, um, you know, has there just been an article in the news about credit card fraud? And the article said everyone was annoyed of, you know, that their cards were getting canceled or whatever the context might be. So you're not necessarily going to be the decision maker always who's setting the decision variable. That might be someone else in your organization, but you will need to interface with that person. And if you can understand their kind of situation here, um, you will be able to interface with them more effectively. So when you're working on a problem like this, I recommend asking yourself these questions. Who is the decision maker? What is their objective? What are their alternatives? Meaning what are the possible choices for the decision variables? What is the context? What data do I need? This last one's a very interesting question that is completely neglected in the course and kind of makes me wonder if that's a mistake. So this, this whole course assumes that the data is already collected and handed to you. But in some cases, you might have a say in the data collection itself, maybe before the data collection even started, or maybe after you might, you might need to say, hey, I really need more data. I really need more of this type of data. Um, and maybe that's something I should think about adding into the course, although it's already pretty full. But that's, that's an important question as well. Do I have enough data? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the second and final activity of the day in the same Google Doc. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about homework seven, which you turned in a few days ago about the avocado prices. And so let's say you have a job with Whole Foods slash Amazon and they've hired you as a data scientist or something. And you've gone through this whole avocado price forecasting and they're trying to figure out should we order more avocados right now for our store or should we maybe wait a little bit and then order more avocados and your job is to do the kind of machine learning side and then you're all gonna figure this out so again there's a bunch of questions here and again uh, you don't need to answer all of them um, but it'd be nice if you answered at least one so today we talked about some principles of effective communication. We had all these different kind of steps. As I mentioned, I think the important ones, most important ones are the bottom up idea and the it's not about you idea. And then we talked about decision making and how ML fits into that.